Our next speaker this morning is James Holman, who is a national political correspondent at the Washington Post. Uh, he writes daily, the, the Daily 202 column. It really is a column which uh, is a go-to for the inside of what's happening in Washington. Jim, so nice to see you again. Uh, it's really an essential reading for those of us that, that are in this every day here in town. I am confident that you'll enjoy hearing his inside perspective, his thoughts, uh, which are, are perceptive and helpful, and thank you for being here again. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, good to be with you all. Uh, it, it's a, obviously a fun time to be in Washington. You may live in interesting times. Uh, sometimes I feel like a, uh, trying to cover everything that's happening, I feel like a, there was a, a YouTube video recently of a woman dumping a bucket of tennis balls in front of her dog. And there's like 20 tennis balls bouncing up and down and the dog is paralyzed because he doesn't know which tennis ball to chase after. And I, I know you all faced a lot of those same challenges too with everything that's coming out of Washington. I want to talk a, a little bit at the top and then open it up for questions to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Uh, you know, we're, we're in a, a, a time of transition, a time of change. What makes my job fun uh, as a political reporter for the Washington Post is n we don't know how it ends. Uh, you know, we, there's, we, the, we don't know in 10 years whether we're going to look back on this moment as sort of the, remember when Donald Trump was president and wasn't that crazy? Or whether we're going to look back at this as a, as a as kind of a fundamental realignment of our politics, that this was the beginning of, of how things changed. Uh, a, you know, a, a year is an eternity in politics. The midterm elections aren't for another year. So obviously Democrats had a good week last week and a, a lot could change by next November. We can, we can talk about all of that. But the, the top line is that the, kind of the theme that I think we've learned over the last 10 months is that Donald Trump really is a disruptor uh, in chief. Uh, and, and whether you like him or not, uh, the, you know, just because someone's a disruptor doesn't mean that's a bad thing. A lot of you obviously have been disruptors in your own institutions. Uh, just because something's been done the same way 50 years doesn't mean that's the right way to do things. But a lot of times there's a reason they've done it that way for 50 years. And, uh, and so kind of trying to, to keep up with everything that's going on here and to discern what's good disruption versus what's unconstructive disruption is, is one of the real challenges we have right now. Uh, and, and you know, there's so many things that are happening in DC that, you know, that in any normal time would, would dominate a week of conversation. And in this environment, you know, they're, they're kind of blips on the radar. Those, those tennis balls I was talking about, they just sort of bounce right past you and, and then you move on. And so I think one of the things we're trying to do in the media is to be the, the signal in the noise to help kind of connect the dots and, and help kind of translate what's really significant, what's going to affect, you know, healthcare or taxes versus what's ephemeral and sort of a, a something that's on Twitter and just a, a news cycle or two, and then we're going to move on. Uh, the, the, you know, we're, we're in an, an interesting moment as the media and, and as consumers of information trying to understand what's happening in Washington because it, there's increasingly fragmentation of our media. Uh, it's easier than any time in American history to only expose yourself to information that that confirms and validates what you already think about the world. And uh, and so that has kind of warped the incentive structure for a lot of folks in Washington. Uh, who, you know, the, the incentive increasingly is to be a show horse rather than a workhorse with a, a bunch of exceptions, including the, the senator we just heard from. Uh, who is very much a workhorse. Uh, and so that the, the, the climate is, you know, it doesn't matter your politics either, whether it's Fox or MSNBC, it's just kind of people go to their corners and we no longer have a shared set of facts. And, uh, and so th these are the kinds of things we're trying to battle through every day. Uh, you know, the, the, we're in this era of fake news and alternative facts. And, and that's, it's, it's sort of, you know, I'm bullish about the future of the media because I think people are, are eager for good, high quality information in a way you know, more than ever when there's so much junk out there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's hard. You have to earn the credibility of, of readers. And, you, you know, in a lot of ways, I think the president wants to use the media as a foil to always be kind of bashing the media uh, in, instead of sometimes focusing on policy. And so I think it's, it, 
is incumbent upon the press not to sort of fall into that trap. You know, the, what I like to say is uh, we're not at war with the administration, we're at work. And so that's, that's the way that we approach covering everything that is happening. Uh, anyway, so with that, I'd, I'd love to open it up for questions to talk about whatever is on, on your mind or regarding the, the agenda or the president or the, the dynamic on Capitol Hill. Any? Uh, Ed Ray, Oregon State. A uh, quick question to go back to your observation about trying to pick out the important points in there. I think a lot of us think of the president as kind of the distractor in chief. Yeah. And if you think about it, I forget the movies, but that the shiny object, mm -hmm. that he's the shiny object or he's holding it up. And a lot of serious stuff <laughs> is going down and it's not getting covered right. quite as much as we would like. What are some of the stories or lines of development that you're most concerned about that you, you're not seeing enough conversation about in the media? Thank you for that question. The, the question is, I mean, what's not getting enough attention? And it's absolutely right. It's a lot easier to write about something the president tweeted. It doesn't take that much work you know, to, to write about you know, drama over whether someone got a facelift or not. But what matters, what you guys are dealing with every day uh, in your states is, is you know, th what's coming out of Congress. Uh, and I, you know, so I think you know, we, a lot of times the, the chaos theory is intentional. Uh, that's in, and and I, you know, I think sometimes when people think Donald Trump is being crazy, he's being crazy like a fox. Uh, there is something to be said for kind of throwing a lot out there and, and forcing people to keep up. And when you start to get bogged down on something, to just change the subject and to, to move on. And so I think sometimes it's important to remember. You know, I, I get I often end up kind of looking up like, oh, when did that kerfuffle or Donnybrook happen? And so I'll search on Google and it'll turn out it was five days ago and it'll feel like five weeks ago and and so trying to remember some of those things that are getting lost uh, I mean there's a, the the as we get to the so this is actually tomorrow is the 300 day mark uh, of, of Trump's presidency and I was actually just yesterday looking he a year ago he put out a contract with the American voter and he laid out these are my the 10 things I'm going to do in the first hundred days and as of today he's accomplished none of the 10 uh, and I, so I think sometimes you don't want to spend all your time just pointing that out, but sometimes it's worth pointing that out, comparing the rhetoric of the campaign to the, the reality of how he's governed. Obviously, tax is just so consequential right now. There is a feeling that Republicans can't not pass something, uh, even if it ends up kind of getting you know, watered down to the point of just being basic tax cuts. There's the sense that you've got to have some points on the board. And, and so sometimes that comes at the expense of looking at the policy. Uh, you know, I think, I think sometimes it's, it's more fun and it's easier to focus on the horse race and who's up and who's down and not the substance. Uh, and so that I, I lead a team at the Washington Post called Power Post and we focus on the intersection of politics and policy. Uh, that good, you know, good policy is informed by politics and politics informs policy and vice versa instead of thinking them, of them as these separate silos, which I think a lot of people do. And, and so trying to look at the, the substance of things is just is so important uh, because I think a lot of times there's this desire to pass a bill or any bill uh, just to put some points on the board and, and the president isn't super focused on, on policy. It's not a criticism. He's, he sort of sees himself as an old style CEO uh, who, who's kind of very top line. And you know I, I, I think even on tax, which he cares about more than healthcare, which doesn't affect him personally, He's kind of very deferential, I think, to his own team and to others, uh, and and so and I think that was to his detriment during the healthcare debate because he was trying, you know, he 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 was very hands off during healthcare, and kind of the lack of presidential leadership in a lot of ways meant, you know, that by the time he did get involved and tried to pull the healthcare bill across the finish line, it was too late, uh, and the the bill was in a place where it wasn't going to be able to get majority support in the Senate. Good morning. Nope. It's, we'll go over who, who just said that. Good morning. Me. Oh, hi. I'm back here. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> the cute Science one over here. here. I'm blind. I need to get my eyes checked. <laughs> uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carolyn Williams from Prairie View Indian University. Uh, my main concern during this um, dis civil discourse is the... Um, tone and the 
environment of the racial divide mm -hmm. and how can we continue to work as a wonderful country when this type of behavior is promoted and encouraged? And what are you seeing as how we can turn this around and what's the tone? We need to get better than we are. Yeah, absolutely. Great question about the racial divide. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, this is something, this has been a, a tough year for uh, race relations unquestionably in the country. Um, you know, one of the, the, President Trump, I think made a strategic calculation that he wanted to keep his base supportive. And so as part of that, throwing a lot out there, uh, you know, we, we've seen wedge issues uh, that have been employed on, on things like the national anthem, uh, which kind of, you know, after Charlottesville, uh, there have been a, a bunch of, of episodes. Uh, so individual leadership matters a great deal there. And, uh, and I think we, you know, you, you've, you've seen a, a hesitancy to have some of those conversations about how to improve tone. Like I talked about, a lot of times there's not, we're not operating under a shared set of facts anymore, and that makes it really hard. You can't debate how to solve a problem if, uh, if you can't even agree on what the problem is. And you know, the, um, I think one of the problems that people outside of DC have with DC is that uh, you know, they put politicians on a pedestal, and, and politicians, I mean, like you all have gotten to know them personally, but they're people. Uh, and, and so you kind of have to understand and think about Washington as, as very personality driven. Uh, a lot of times it's more personality driven than it is substance driven. Uh, there was, a, the, the State Department had me meet with a group of foreign journalists from the Middle East. And, uh, and one of them asked on a scale of one to 10, how much is DC like House of Cards? Uh, and you know, I, I, don't, I guess some House of Cards fans in here. Uh, and I said, well, no, it's, what it's really a lot more like is Veep. Has anyone watch Veep? Anyone? That's, that comes much closer to reality for what DC is really like. It is, you know, it's people driven, it's ego driven. I mean, when you go to the Senate, you look around during the Obama years, you looked at the Republicans and, you know, a third of them wanted to run for president and they did. Now you go and you look at the Democrats and a third of them want to run for president. You know, to, to wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and think, I'm more qualified than 330 million other people to be president of the United States requires a special view. Of, of oneself <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so there's, a, there's healthy egos uh, and, and, and so to, to, to kind of bring it back to the question, it does require these individual personalities to be willing to put country first, to be willing to say things that might in, uh, upset their base a little bit rather than trying to, to play to their base. Uh, that's how we're gonna, we're gonna kind of, I think, improve on, on the question you asked about, Peter. Yeah, uh, Michael O'Quinn, Texas A&M, and thank Great. you for affecting my productivity in the morning. It takes about 30 minutes to get through it, and it, uh, but I appreciate what you do. So how much should we read into the Virginia elections as a precursor for future ele elections in the country? Yeah, so the, how much do we read from the Virginia elections into future elections? It's such a great question. Uh, I think, you know, t last Tuesday was the best day for Democrats politically since Barack Obama was reelected in 2012. Now, the thing was, there just weren't that many elections, so it's not, it doesn't change the, the balance of power in Congress. Uh, and you can't overread, there are a lot of examples in the past of, of off-year elections not necessarily forecasting what happens the next year, but you look across the country and there were, uh, a lot of people got elected who weren't expected to get elected because they had Ds after their name. And people weren't really voting for the Democrat in a lot of cases, but. In, especially in Virginia, which is a state that's increasingly become Democratic and has become, you know, the, the last Republican to win statewide in Virginia was Bob McDonnell, who's elected governor in 2009. And Hillary Clinton was the only Southern state that she carried. So you, you don't want to read too much into Virginia as the country, but it still is actually a swing state. And, and, you know, in the final hours, I spent a lot of time in Virginia the last couple months. In the final hours of that race, both the Republicans the Ed Gillespie campaign and the Ralph Northam campaign, the Democrat who won, thought that the race, both sides told me that it was gonna be a two point race either way. Both sides thought that they would win by two points. And, and so, you know, the, it wasn't just sort of a preordained thing that the Democrats were gonna win there. I think that the, the gains that they made in, the, uh, in the, the state house were really something and, and kind of caught everyone off guard. Just the, the Terry McAuliffe, the outgoing Democratic governor told me the week before the election, that it would be a really good night if they got six. You know, that I think they ended up getting 14 or 15. So the, the, 
they're definitely, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a good election for Democrats. What was interesting, among other things, is, is some of the rising stars, some of the people who won who weren't expected to win uh, here in, in or I guess not here in Virginia, just across the Potomac in Virginia. You had, uh, you know, the, the first Asian American woman elected to the legislature. You had the first two Latinas elected uh, in, uh, in a place like, you know, in, in one of those Latinas is a Peruvian immigrant who had to pay her way through school who decided to run for office because her kids told her that the president of the United States hates people who speak Spanish. So you have this whole class of people who chose to run in response to Donald Trump. That he's And, and you saw the exit polls, we did an exit poll in Virginia. Uh, Trump won among married women and among, uh, and Hillary, Hillary won relatively narrowly among college educated women in Virginia in 2016. Uh, the Democrat made huge gains among, the Democrat won narrowly among married women and, and, and ran up the score pretty significantly among college educated women. So th there's, there are kind of warning signs uh, that people are getting involved in the process uh, in, in reaction to what's going on in Washington and that, uh, that some people who I think might have reluctantly voted for Trump last year uh, are, are sort of having some degree of buyer's remorse. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, Donald Trump still has time to course correct. It's not sure. It's not clear that he wants to, uh, but but there there is time to course correct. One of the things that was interesting about Virginia is that Ed Gillespie, the former Republican chairman, you know, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, he 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 barely won the Republican primary in June by less than one percentage point. It wasn't supposed to be close, and he was up against this sort of gadfly who was the chairman of Trump's Virginia campaign in 2016. Uh, actually got fired by the Trump campaign for being too pro-Trump, uh, for protesting uh, Reince Priebus outside the RNC after the Access Hollywood tape came out. And so um, he, he barely lost the primary to Gillespie. Gillespie's as a, literally as establishment Republican as you could come. And so what was interesting to watch was how he tried to thread that needle. Trump never came and campaigned in Virginia for him, but you know, he did tweet, they sent Mike Pence not to the kind of the vote rich Northern Virginia suburbs, but out to coal country. Virginia, for those who don't know the state well, is it, Virginia's a huge state. It's not Texas by any stretch, but the distance from here to uh, like Abingdon, Virginia, which is where Mike Pence went to campaign uh, for, for the Republican is farther than the distance from here to Boston. So it's a, it's a big state uh, and, and it's very, very different up here than it is in in that part of coal country. Final point on Virginia that was interesting was, you know, the, the red parts of the state actually got redder and the blue parts got bluer. It wasn't just that the whole state's kind of traditionally in these backlash elections, uh, whether it was the 2010, 2009, 2010 against Obama, which happened in Virginia, or, uh, you know, the everything kind of moves. But in fact, there were a lot of the, the conservative areas of the state actually became even more red than they were a year ago, even without Trump on the ballot. Uh, and, the, and the blue areas became much bluer uh, in a lot of these, these state house seats where kind of random unexpected people won. They won because Hillary Clinton had carried that, you know, House of Dele you know, the House of Delegates district a year ago and people didn't really think of their local politician as, as a national referendum. And all of a sudden, you know, they're, uh, you know, these, these, these Republicans in Hillary districts got knocked out. So the, the question is, will Democrats be able, will, will Democrats be able to knock off Republican incumbents? In the House next year, there are 24 House districts where Hillary Clinton won and they're represented by a Republican. You've seen, I think now, half a dozen Republican congressmen retire from districts because they don't want to be up for re-elections in, in places that are going to be tough to win in 2018. So someone like Dave Reichert from the Seattle suburbs, he's retiring. That's a district Hillary Clinton won by three points. He's, he's sort of a former sheriff, pretty popular Republican. And, and you know, the people like that have brands and identities in their home districts that are unique from Donald Trump. But if it's a, if it's a bad environment for Republicans, some of those guys might lose anyway. I'm in the back, now I can see. You, if you yell, I can probably hear you. I can yell, but I'd rather do this. Good morning, I'm Gretchen Dobson, and I'm 
uh, global alumni relations champion. Um, work for Academic Assembly, a firm based in New York and Australia, but we work globally. I'm an American citizen. I live in Australia. I travel monthly throughout the world. I'm very concerned about reputational management of the United States around the world. And it starts with ego. It's about building brand. But our institutions in America are, are challenged every day. International student perceptions about coming here partnerships. People may be worried about what's going to happen next year, this year, what the risks are, what are the rewards. So I'm asking about the relationship of the foreign press here in Washington, and what kind of relationship do you have with them? Hmm. And do they look for you, to you and other colleagues to kind of provide the facts so that they can build the story from there, and how to interpret what is seen as real or fake or whatever it is on a daily basis, it does impact us. Yeah, absolutely, great question. In, in terms of my relationship with the foreign press, I mean, the, what's, it, it is, I mean, the, Donald Trump is an object of intense fascination to everyone in this room, I assume, and, uh, and everyone around the world. People are watching uh, the, you know, the, on Capitol Hill, it's become an issue. I've, I've covered Congress now for the better, for more than a decade, and they, uh, you know, the, the scrums around senators have gotten bigger and bigger, and a lot of those are foreign reporters, and, you know, the, the, the number of reporters who cover Congress has actually been declining in recent years because a lot of regional newspapers, you know, the Houston Chronicle or, um, or whatnot, are, are scaling back in Washington. A lot of, you know, I, before I came to the Washington Post, I worked at the San Jose Mercury News and the Dallas Morning News and the Los Angeles Times, and, you know, all those places used to have much bigger Washington bureaus than than they do now. And so uh, there's sort of been, in, you know, there's been a, a huge upsurge in interest among a lot of places that have been scaling back about what's going on. And so there's a ton of foreign reporters at the Capitol. They are covering this intensively. I, you know, I see what they're, they're doing. I spend a lot of time talking to reporters and, and uh, you know, the, the, you know, a lot of times their coverage doesn't reflect well, you know, they have a, a viewpoint uh, and their, their, the reports they're sending back home don't always reflect well on Washington or the United States. Uh, and, and I think a lot of times, you know, there is, you, you hear a lot of concern from people, especially early on this year about, you know, what's gonna happen with NAFTA. Uh, you know, I, I get that all the time from Canadian reporters and Mexican reporters. Uh, people in Europe were very concerned about NATO uh, especially, you know, the the Eastern Bloc, uh, what's what's going to happen there? So there's there, there's there's a lot the uncertainty that is emanating from Washington. I think kind of exudes throughout the world, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, the, I I do think we were talking about chaos earlier. Uh, the there, I think Trump subscribes to what Henry Kissinger originally called the Madman Theory, uh, which is you know if people think you're crazy enough to do something outrageous, they maybe are more likely to negotiate or concede. And, and I think that has worked for the president at times in his business career. And so, um, you know, I think with something like NAFTA, you know, I, I hear all the time from Canadians who are freaked out, and, and I'm sure a lot of you probably do too. Uh, and, and I think then you hear from White House people who kind of will say, well, he's just trying to, he's trying to bring them to the table to get concessions. And so that, I think, but that sort of posture, what, you know, the word uh, you know, the, is the, the same week that North Korea did a nuclear launch, Trump said publicly that it, we needed to throw away our trade deal with the South Koreans, which, you know, freaked out a lot of people in D.C. And, and on the Korean Peninsula. You know, I think some of that is, is just trumping Trump. And the, and the challenge we've had for the last two and a half years is how much do we take him literally versus seriously? Uh, you know, and, and, and it is, it makes it hard because he may be on both sides of an issue at any given time. He's not, you know, kind of, he, when he says something, he's not locking himself in. And I think that that puzzles people who, from overseas who are trying to cover what's going on here. You know, look at something, uh, this Asia trip, which the president gets back from Asia tonight after 11 days on the road. And, you know, a few weeks ago he said, there is no diplomatic option in North Korea. Uh, he tweeted, as his Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was negotiating uh, with the North Koreans that Rex is wasting his time. And then in his speech in Seoul, which was well-received, 
to the uh, South Korean Assembly, he said, you know, we need to we need to come to the table and we need to make a deal with North Korea to get them to, uh, you know, put aside their nuclear program, and so kind of that the the mixed messaging I think sometimes leaves all of us a little confused. Uh, what does he what does he really think? Is he actually willing to cut a deal? How real is this? Uh, how kind of shaken should we be by some of the things that he says? And and that is one of the reasons that it's it's challenging as a journalist in this environment. One more question. Did you, oh, we can go back there. Hi, Terry Kinsey from Rutgers University. We've spent a lot of time at this meeting talking about communication from our side, especially in the area of research, getting out the stories, getting out the facts, getting out the data on the impact of decisions that are made in Washington, whether it's policy or finance. What words would you have for us about how we can more effectively get attention for the messages that we're developing to sort of help to drive some of the recognition of what we're doing mm -hmm. and how it can have a positive impact? Yeah, a great question. Nothing beats a good story. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what reporters in your hometowns want uh, is, a, is a good and compelling story. And so, you know, I, I think um, just trying to connect, you know, that obviously, you know, Senator Blunt was just talking about the budget and kind of laughed, and, and it was he, it was funny. You know, presidents' blueprints are worth the paper they're printed on. You know, for the for the budget, but it also you can't just completely dismiss it. That's an example of seriously versus literally. You know, if the if a president's calling for caps or ten percent cuts, or you can't just sort of not take that stuff seriously. You understandably uh, need to engage with it because it is a statement of of priorities. So I think in in thinking about showcasing the research that your universities are doing, it is important to have a good story and to be sort of on the news. And what I mean by that is connecting it to these contemporaneous, uh, the, the, or contemporary debates that we're having about uh, you know, what, what to fund and what not to fund. Uh, and and you know, a lot of times, you know, the, there's not, a lot of times within the administration there's division. So you know, the, this isn't like a kind of a, I think if Ted Cruz was president, for example, you would have a very, the, the, the administration would sort of ideologically be on the same page. Uh, but, but there's, you know, inside the White House, there's a lot of tension and divide, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, people in the White House refer to a bunch of their colleagues who work in the Trump White House as, as the Democrats uh, and, you know, the, or the globalists and, and you kind of have the, the Steve Bannon wing of the party. And so, you know, I think having, having some patron um, or supporter or ally inside the administration is actually easier than in, in some administrations, Republican or Democrat, because there's so many different people with so many different agendas. And, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it, it's, it's, if you can get one of those factions on your side, then, then your program is safe. And so thinking about how do, you, how do you kind of do something that will resonate with one of the, the factions in the government. I can go over here. Yeah. Would you, uh, Peter McPherson, would you talk about how you think the tax bill, the broad shape of it, the, the major components, uh, comment a moment about that if you would, uh, but then if you would, uh, if you've had a chance to focus on it, the House had a, a number of provisions that dealt, where really were blows to students. Mm -hmm. Uh, those provisions, for the most part, are not in the Senate bill, though we've got a number of other concerns in the Senate bill. Right. Uh, maybe you could talk about the dynamics there. First, the broad outline of how it might come out, and, yeah. and then the university. Yeah, uh, no, so the, I mean, that's so the, the, you know, the thing about tax reform is that, um, you know, the, the theory, as everyone here knows, is, is you kind of get rid of a bunch of breaks so that you can. Um, streamline rates and, and lower rates simplify things. Um, I think the, you know, just kind of big picture putting personal kind of stakeholders aside, the, uh, you know, that the idea is that, you know, the idea animating congressional leadership is to do it so quickly that that there's not time to stop some, you know, to protect some of these individual things. But you have already seen a lot of public tensions emerge. So they, we didn't see, as everyone here knows, we didn't see the language of the bill until very, very late. Um, they're gonna pass the House bill this week. 
um, you know, then they're going to have a markup on the Senate bill. They're still trying to kind of ram this through. And I don't say that as a negative thing. They're trying to ram this through by Christmas. And, and they sort of, there is a widespread sense on Capitol Hill that they have to do something and that they, if they let this drag on past Christmas, it's going to be really, really hard because opposition will marshal to protecting a lot of the, you know, the individual things people like. Many of them, which are very good and popular, you know, for their own, popular for their own reasons um, and, and have important constituencies. Obviously, there's quite a lot that affects what you all do. And, and so I, 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 the way I sort of see it playing out is that the House is gonna go very far, the Senate is gonna go not as far. Uh, you know, this December 12th special election could end up being very significant right now. So in Alabama, you know, Republicans have a two seat majority. It increasingly looks like it's gonna be a one seat majority come December 12th. And so, um, you know, Mike Pence has already cast more tie breaking votes as vice president than any vice president in US history during his first year in office. So that they don't have a lot of margin for error there. Uh, and then you have a bunch of retiring Republican senators who have made clear they don't want to expand the, the budget deficit that much. So they sort of, they have agreed not to expand the, the debt by more than $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. But you have, you know, Bob Corker from Tennessee, Jeff Flake from Arizona, uh, John McCain from Arizona, and a couple other folks uh, who are deficit minded. And so the, the point is they can only lose one or two Republicans. So they, they're not gonna get any Democratic votes for tax reform, that's increasingly clear. Uh, a lot of Democrats who are up for reelection in 2018 have to pretend like they're interested in voting for it so that they can't get attacked uh, for, for being obstructionist if you're from a state like North Dakota or Missouri, you know, you know where you're a Democrat up for reelection. But, but um, so re Republicans have very little margin for error in the Senate. So that means that the Senate is gonna be in the driver's seat on tax reform. They're basically gonna end up passing whatever bill can make it through the Senate. The House is gonna be desperate enough for a win of any kind that they'll pass what makes it through the Senate. So then the question is, what's gonna make it through the Senate? And I do think it, it seems like, you know, there's constituencies among Republican senators to protect a lot of these individual things. Uh, you know, so like the adoption tax credit they got rid of in the House bill and you know some social conservative senate senators got it added back in in the senate bill so you know i think like the adoption tax credit's now off the table so you're gonna i think that's gonna keep happening with a bunch of things uh, i assume you will be able to prevail on on certain republican senators to protect things that are important to your institutions and and so um that's that's why i said earlier i think tax reform is going to end up becoming tax cuts like it's not you're not reforming the tax code if you just cut taxes. Uh, I think, you know, they're going to end up kind of, they're just going to end up moving closer and closer to the lowest common denominator because they need to get basically 50 votes. Mike Pence can cast the tie-breaking vote. And so I don't know how far that goes or where that takes them, uh, but I, I, I do know they're, they're just desperate to pass anything, and there are a handful of Republicans who aren't just going to go along with the House bill. Uh, and, and so and don't have an incentive to. So I think that's the direction the debate is happening, but I should stress that this is happening very, very quickly. Uh, you know, the, they're, they're moving with a, they're, they're trying to move quickly because their mentality is speed kills. And if they, if, like as I said, if they let this drag on, the sense is that the whole bill will fall apart. I'm over here. Oh, hey. Hi, I'm Ann Buckley from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, UAB is part of the University of Alabama system, which is one of the most respected systems of higher ed in the country. And all of that said, there's a spotlight on our state right now yeah. um, with uh, uh, Roy Moore wanting to, to be the senator from Alabama. And I'm wondering, what is your take on, on, on that whole matter? <laughs> roll Thank Tide. You. Can I just say Roll Tide? Roll Tide. The, Go uh, Blazers. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I assume Auburn's here somewhere, but um, <laughs> the uh, um, yeah the uh, you know so I, I wrote a whole column about this this morning. So if you want to go to, I mean, I'll give you the answer. But WashingtonPost.com, I wrote a, a big thing, sort of laying out basically why Republicans are in a lose-lose situation here. It's um, it's a difficult spot to be in, um, and you sort of feel sympathy for for someone like Mitch McConnell because. 
he, um, if, if, you know, if, if Moore loses, it's everything I was just talking about with that. If they lose one vote, it becomes a lot harder to do a lot of things. Um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that wouldn't have happened this year if they didn't have 52, if they had 51 seats instead of 52 seats. Um, so, you know, that it's not insignificant. You know, they even had to put off some votes last week because Rand Paul in Kentucky got beat up by his neighbor. And so he wasn't there. It's kind of funny, unless you see him, you feel like it's, um, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, the, uh, um, you know, so like just not having Rand Paul's vote last week had forced them to kick some stuff to this week. So it's a big deal to lose a, a Senate seat. Um, and, you know, more a, a, a fifth accuser came forward yesterday. Um, you know, the, the New Yorker posted a story overnight with more than a dozen people who are saying that Roy Moore was, was, banned from the local mall because he tried to pick up teenage girls there. Um, you have, you know, more credible people coming forward. And, and so, um, it, and it does seem like the, um, there's not appetite to kick him off the ballot. Uh, Kay Ivey, the governor said she's still planning to support him last night. Um, the chairman of the state Republican party said they're not going to try to kick him off. And, you know, meanwhile here in DC, McConnell said, I believe the women, he should step aside. The chairman of the NRSC, the Senate Republican Campaign Committee, uh, said that he should be expelled if he gets elected. So, you know, it's the, I think Republicans are going to end up being divided, which benefits the Democrat, Doug Jones. George Will, the conservative columnist, has a column in today's Washington Post urging Alabama, Alabamians uh, to, to vote for Doug Jones, the Democrat, which is a remarkable thing. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, then if he gets if he gets kind of, if he wins, he becomes a, a lightning rod for Republicans. And I think they know that. Um, it becomes, you know, he's, he, I think McConnell is scared to have him in the Senate because he does represent, you know, his whole campaign is, not his whole campaign, a lot of his campaign has been about removing McConnell as majority leader. And, uh, and there's kind of this sense that it would be a, sort of a mess among Republicans for him to be there. And, but at the same time, we've only ever expelled 15 senators in the history of the United States. 14 of those 15 were because of their work for the Confederacy. Uh, the last time someone got expelled from the Senate was 1862. Uh, so that it's, you know, it's, it's not gonna happen. If he wins, he's gonna end up getting seated. And so Republicans do feel like they're in this lose-lose situation. Uh, and you know, the, the question is how many more accusers come forward? Um, and you know, the, there's talk, there's sort of these, these Hail Mary machinations about like getting, could you get a write-in campaign going for Jeff Sessions so that you know he could step down as attorney general and become senator again? Uh, Luther Strange, who lost in the Republican primary to uh, Roy Moore, said last night that he's not going to do a write-in campaign. That he it's he doesn't think a write-in campaign would work. So that so basically the the feeling among Republicans right now is that they're sort of stuck with Moore and and they don't and in D.C. at least D.C. Republicans don't want him to win because they think it would be better to lose than to win. Uh, so that, that's, that's sort of the, the top line dynamic, but it's gonna be fascinating to watch. Um, and, and, you know, it, there, are, there are certainly some, there's certainly some number of people who are gonna vote for him anyway, despite all of these allegations, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Good morning. Hey. Mark Burnham from Michigan State University. Uh, continuing along the theme of what's going on with the Republicans uh, beyond the December 12th election, um, where is the public, Republican Party going through a realignment? Um, is it, you know, what's going to happen with it? Is Bannon going to be able to successfully run campaign uh, primaries against these guys? And uh, is the Republican Party even look like it used to? That's, that, that we're in a period of disruption. And like I said at the very top, we don't know how it ends. That's what makes my job fun. Because uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, I, there is a civil war in the Republican Party. There's a civil war, frankly, in the Democratic Party, too. Uh, and I think, you know, Steve Bannon is going to try really hard to run against establishment-aligned senators. And he may not win uh, some of those races. He may win a couple. Uh, the, the Republican Party is sort of divided uh, between the the governing wing that is focused on trying to get things done and, and sort of the Bannon wing 
you know, which for lack of a better word, you know, Steve Bannon, this is Steve Bannon's term, like Steve Bannon has described himself as a political arsonist. Uh, he wants to burn things down. Now, I know you guys run into, that's not the, your approach, uh, but, but Steve Bannon wants to, to burn Washington down and he wants to burn the Republican Party down. He thinks the Republican Party has to be destroyed to be recreated as this populist, nationalist party that, that expels the you know, free trade, uh, pro-international engagement uh, wing of the party. Now, I don't think that's gonna happen because I think you know, there, was a, there's, there was a fascinating Pew study. Every couple of years they do a typology study and it's this, it's this massive sample. It's several thousand people and they do these big surveys and they ask a lot of different questions. And so they, they this came out two weeks ago, they group all people into like one of nine different groups. So it's not just Republican, Democrat, Independent. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, there's sort of, I don't remember exactly the terms that they used, but there is, Republicans are basically evenly split between three different kinds of Republicans. And so those battles are gonna to continue to play out. And I don't think that they're gonna be decisive in any way. Uh, you know, I don't think the Republicans are gonna go back to being a completely pro free trade global engagement party. And I don't think that they're gonna go, you know, to being a, a America first, uh, you know, protectionist, isolationist party either. You know, and there's also tension on, on immigration that is very real that divides the party. So I, I think those tensions are gonna continue to exist uh, beyond the Trump era. And, and it's gonna be, you know, in, in some ways, Trump, Trump's vision of republicanism, remember Donald Trump was a registered Democrat until 2009. Uh, Trump's vision of republicanism is, is sort of winning the day right now, but when Trump's gone, will anyone be able to, to kind of carry that torch? If Mike Pence becomes president, that's not who he is. Will he try to repackage himself as a Donald Trump style Republican or will he be the Mike Pence, you know, who, who is a House Republican voted against Medicare Part D and was sort of a, a basically a proto member of the Freedom Caucus uh, and a Tea Party guy. Uh, that, like I said, we don't know how it ends. So stay tuned. Read my column. <laughs> <This is> the... <laughs> Thank you.